now? Yeah. Okay. How's this better? Or is this better? Good enough. Apologies for that. This is, I've given many lectures for the AIA, as you heard, and particularly uh, here in Boulder, I used to give one probably every year when I came back from the field, but I've never before given a Zoom lecture. So forgive, forgive me if things go wrong, because I'm of the school where we used to show slides and write on the board with chalk, if any of you ever remember that, that, that that's how old I am. But anyway, and I, I was thinking about uh, possibilities for uh, working with ancient maritime history, if you will, uh, or archaeology, but mostly history at that time. And I started to do some research when I started graduate school to try to see what existed in terms of literary sources that might be useful for me. I found practically nothing. A lot of platitudes. Oh, the ancients, the sea was important to the Romans, the sea was important to the Athenians. But when you started to look for details, it simply, they, they were not there. So, I decided that maybe I should move in, in different directions. Um, I knew that there had been things found in the sea uh, that had been brought up, but they were really just chance finds. This was salvage. And uh, let's see if I, I need some help here. This, is, this seems not to be moving forward. What? I have to use this. Yeah, uh, as I say, salvage has had been going on for centuries, and uh, this is this was helpful, of course. Some artifacts being brought from the sea, all of them in their own way, helped to expand our knowledge of the ancient world. But the, the and I decided, well, maybe I should look at some of the earliest ones. And this is one of the earliest ones I found reporting an act of salvage. This is from a, a relief at the city of Ostia, which was the port for ancient Rome. And you can see in this slide, fishermen are pulling a statue of Heracles from the sea. Now, this was quite an event. Obviously, the fishermen who did this had no idea how the statue got there. It was obviously some sort of a, uh, a statement from the gods. And as a result, the statue went into a pent temple and the temple for Heracles was built on the city of Ostia. This was an early one, statues. People were very keen about statues being found in the sea. And there have been a lot of them from starting in antiquity right up to the present. And for those of you uh, maybe in the audience or in the Zoom audience who have been to the uh, National Museum in Athens and you have marveled at the bronze statues that are on display there, they all have come from the sea. Uh, and this one particularly from uh, the wreck at Antikythera but in days gone by, uh, these statues were recovered by divers who wore hard helmets, which is a pretty cumbersome way of having to move around the sea. So this was salvage, salvage, that's all it was. So uh, 1960, then I started uh, graduate school. And as the old saying goes, timing is everything. I had no idea began my graduate work in the fall of 1960. At that summer, two rather important archaeological expeditions had occurred. One was conducted by then graduate student George Bass from the University of Pennsylvania. He uh, had an opportunity to learn how to dive and then to try to excavate a Bronze Age shipwreck off Cape Caledonia. This was something very new archaeologists who were divers. The same summer in Israel, a man named Ed Link, Edwin Link, who was a very famous oceanographer at the time, uh, started a survey of a large harbor installation that had been built by King Herod at Caesarea Maritima. This was more old fashioned in the sense that archaeologists stayed on board the ship and had professional divers go down to find things and tell them what they found. Now, obviously, the problems inherent in that system uh, are obvious to all of us. But I had no idea this was going on. I had no idea that people had started to do systematic archaeological investigations beneath the sea. Um, it was not just me who realized that the Mediterranean could be an archive and that maybe many of the answers to the questions that I had about 
how the ancients responded to the sea and their relationship to the sea would come from the Mediterranean itself. Uh, as I said, I had no idea about this. So I had decided then that I would move in very different directions. I thought I would, in fact, uh, point a couple of, uh, to discuss a couple of ways in which this underwater archaeology has actually benefited us. I think uh, when it returns to, let's say, a sub-branch of marine or maritime archaeology, nautical archaeology, uh, it has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, in the last several decades, many ancient shipwrecks have been found in the Mediterranean. You have an image here of one that was found off the coast of Israel at Caesarea. I'm working here holding a light for Bill Kurtzinger, a National Geographic photographer. We're looking at the frames of a very large Roman merchant ship. Uh, shifting sands had revealed some of these timbers and we were able to clean it off and get a fair idea of how large the ship, ship was. Uh, other shipwrecks that I've seen, and if you're lucky, they look like this, uh, untouched on the ocean floor. You can see this was a cargo ship of amphoras, and amphora was, or an amphora, uh, an amphora was a sh uh, the shipping crate of antiquity, if you will. Everything the ancient ship or used in foodstuffs and so on went into these containers. And here you have a wreck site, untouched, and that's becoming increasingly rare because of all the deep water dredging that's going on in the Mediterranean, which is destroying a lot of shipwrecks. But information like this, and of course we have a few illustrations of what ancient ships looked like, but again, nothing in the ancient texts to tell us about it. But using the information that we had, we've been able to do a variety of things, like the shipwreckage is here with a large square cell is a, a copy, or let's say a reproduction, a model, if you will, of the ship that I showed you earlier that we had been, uh, we found off Caesarea. This was a large Roman merchant ship uh, capable of carrying perhaps a thousand tons of cargo. Um, this was the larger ship to sail the Mediterranean for a thousand years after this particular point in time. And if you think about it, the ship itself is probably the most sophisticated ancient machine that was ever constructed. Uh, but there were limitations to it. And I, I pictured, uh, I have a picture here of a, of a modern ship, uh, sailing ship, the Sea Cloud One, a ship that carries 32 sails. The ancient ships carried three. Why they didn't go beyond this and why a more sophisticated sail technology didn't develop, we have no idea, but it didn't. This in turn, the fact that we gathered so much information about shipwrecks from maritime archeology span has led to experimental archeology span where using the information that we had, it, was, it has been possible to make reproductions of certain ancient vessels and then sail them to see what the capabilities might have been. The, the picture we have here is of the shipwreck, um, the Kyrenia. This was based on a shipwreck that was found off the northern coast of Turkey, underwent a whole series of sea trials, and we were quite amazed at what this ship could do. Most of the ancient commerce in the maritime world was conducted in ships like this, popping from one, one point on shore to the other to the other without too much in the way of open water sailing, much like a Greek kaiki today, and almost about the same size. The most impressive to date, the most impressive of the ancient uh, of the reproductions was this one. This is a picture of a Greek trireme. Uh, when Athens ruled the world, when they were lords of the sea, this was the ultimate weapon in naval warfare. And given uh, information gathered from shipwrecks, from literary texts, from modern naval engineers looking at what information we had, this replica was built, or this reproduction was built. And here it is sailing into the harbor of Athens in 2004. It brought the Olympic torch back to Greece after it had made its trip around the world. A very impressive example of what experimental archeology span can do. I had my own experience with this, not in a shipwreck, but in fact, when in my harbor studies, um, I'll have more to say about this later. And as Dimitri said, this is the final product of years and years of work building for antiquity, uh, the history and technology of Roman concrete engineering in the sea. But as part of our project, 
using information that we had gathered from exploration of harbors and the study of Roman of concrete monuments from the Roman period that we'd found, uh, and from the few literary sources that we had, it was possible to try to reproduce uh, or to re reproduce a Roman pier or a pila as it was called in the sea. We did this to try to figure out a way that Romans, given their technology, how they could have built something like this uh, with the materials they had and the techniques that they had. And here I am at the very end of this project in 2004. We're finishing up. I'm putting the final uh, bit of, uh, of uh, mortar on top of the uh, concrete. And uh, because as an archaeologist, I never find coins, which are datable objects, where I want them. I decided I would give someone a break down the road, and I sprinkled Euro coins here. And at the same time, thinking that, hmm, since this uh, Roman concrete itself has survived for two millennia and counting, who knows how long this block is going to last? And what if somebody three or 400, 500 years from now decides to examine this and says, ah, Roman concrete, and then discovers a coin from the early 21st century? There's a dissertation topic for you. Uh, but I, I, I wasn't really thinking about that when I did that. But anyway, that, that, uh, that was, that's been my example. And as far as I know, this is the only example we have of experimental archaeology and harbor research. Now, I promised uh, that I would talk about five different topics here, five different episodes in my career. I'll present them in chronological order. Uh, the first involved my work uh, at a place called Cancriae in ancient Greece. This was the eastern seaport of the city of Corinth on the Saronic Gulf. And how this came to pass, again, is an interesting, some background. Having rejected, as I said, in 1960, that I was going to study anything about the ancients and the sea, I became interested in ancient numismatics. Uh, the possibility or the realization that coins, ancient coins, were historical documents. They, would, they told us things about the societies that minted them. And that had, in turn, had led to my getting a, a fellowship at the American Numismatic Society in the summer of 1962, where I was mentored by a man named Otto Merkholm, one of the leading uh, European numismatists. And that gave me a credential that, as it turned out, really worked in my favor, because the following year, in 1963, the University of Chicago and Indiana University decided to have, or got permission to have this uh, project of the city uh, to excavate the city of uh, Cancriae. And as luck would have it, again, timing is everything, the uh, numismatist that was scheduled to work with them at the last minute, she canceled. They needed somebody, and here I was with a shiny new credential saying that I was an ancient numis numismatist. So I really had no idea in the world what I was going to be doing a, with excavation coinage, but it was an opportunity to go to Cancriae. So, so that's precisely what I did. And the city itself, uh, this is a slide from our picture from, as you see from Google Earth, 2010, but you see a crescent-shaped harbor, essentially. The road that you see in the slide did not exist from when we went there in 1963. In fact, it was a very isolated part of Greece then. There were no roads. You got there by donkey or with a very reliable Range Rover. Uh, no running water in that area, no electricity. Uh, we set up base camp and we had workmen coming in from five neighboring villages. They would arrive early Monday morning and then leave on Saturday at noon. And many of them camped out on the beach, which was, and, and on an occasion, I was able to spend time with them. It was a marvelous affair of the heart as I fell in love with Greece, sleeping on the beach at night. It's really quite wonderful. But what really intrigued me was what you can see in this slide. A good chunk of this harbor was underwater. And my first weekend that I was there, I was able to go to Athens and buy my first mask and snorkel and fins. And that gave me an opportunity literally every day to swim over the ruins. Our work schedule was we start around sunrise and break for around 1230 or so for lunch and afterwards because of the heat of the day. There was a siesta time, but I took that opportunity to swim. And I would swim over these rooms, and I had an incredible experience 
literally swimming over time. That was it. I decided I want to do this. At the end of the summer, I asked the director, Bob Scranton, from Chicago, when are you going to do any kind of archaeological investigations in the sea? And he said to me, well, we don't do that. Oh, OK. What, uh, the architect of the project was a man named Joe Shaw, who uh, Sarah and Dimitri know very well, went on to have a very distinguished career at University of Toronto. It's a specialist in Minoan history and archaeology. Joe and I said, well, let's, let's, let's see what we can do. And I went back and I learned how to dive that summer uh, that, and during uh, the university years. Came back in the summer of 1964, my career and the underwater archaeological excavations at Cancri began. We really had no idea what we were doing because there was no book. Nobody else had done it. Every day we were inventing methodology, trying things out. It was great fun. And the episode that I am going to be talking about occurred one day. The arrow I'm, uh, is pointing to a, an apsidal building, which I will now show you, that became very important. This is where that episode occurred. Um, our Greek workmen, all of them from the various villages, seemed to have the same tradition. And that tradition was that when St. Paul had come to Corinth, he had worshipped in this chapel that was now underwater. They were convinced that this apsidal building was a chapel where Paul had worshipped. And there was a lot of pressure to do something, to do some excavations here. But we really didn't know how to do it because the water was so shallow. Uh, and all the only archaeological tool that marine archaeologists had at that time was something called an airlift. And that worked only in 15 and 20 feet and beyond depths of water. It didn't work shallow water. So Joe and I were really hard pressed as to figure out how we were going to do this. Our solution was we, got an, we were able to find an old pump and a fire hose. And we were able to create, use the fire hose to create a jet of water like we'd be putting out a fire, which was then we'd have it, someone hold it above the area to be excavated. And even though we're working in two or three feet of water, we created a current and we could fan things up into the current to be carried away. The problem was, you can see from this building, it didn't really go very far into the open sea. And very quickly, we lost any kind of visibility when we were working blind. And this one day, I was there, and I was in the murky water because we lost the visibility. And I was working underneath the floor. And if you can look carefully on this, you can see that there's some rocks that are almost up to the surface of the, of the water. That was, a, that was a floor of some sort. And we were trying to clear out under the floor. And I couldn't see what I was doing. I put my hand in, ouch, all of a sudden I had obviously like cut it on something. I said, cut it on glass. I, oh, this is not good. This is some sort of a disturbed archeological context. And this is probably a beer bottle or something. And I came out, didn't know quite what, I, what had happened. And we had to wait about two or three hours until the water cleared. And then we could see that, no, it wasn't a beer bottle. It was in fact, a portion of a glass panel Beautiful colors were visible. Some sort of a glass panel. We later know, learned that this was a type of artwork called Opus Sectili. And it was, we had no idea then in, in, in 63 whether this was a one off or if there might have been more of them or how we were going to go about excavating. But it was quite clear that using the fire hose was not the way to do it because if accidentally the jet hit the, plant, the uh, panel or the glass panel, it was gone. That was my end of, of the story in 64. 65, 66, 67, those summers, the US Army had other things for me to do. It was a pretty busy time, as you may recall, Vietnam was starting. I didn't get back to the site until 1968. And by then, Bob Scranton had wisely decided, forget the underwater excavations, it's whatever was there might be too valuable. And he, where well, you see the walls here, he had used the walls and built a coffer dam around the whole building and then pumped it dry. And I was back there in time to see the last of a series of stacks of panels. These, these uh, it wasn't just one glass panel, it turned out to be 120 of them, about one meter by a meter and a half, stacked in wooden crates, 
face to face, the glass was face to face with straw dunnage. And of course, over time that disappeared and the glass panels fused together. And here's what one of those soggy collections, there were nine, nine of these. I was there in time to see one lifted. There was some work done on the preservation and restoration of the glass, very expensive, very time consuming. And it turns out they were really quite remarkable images that, that came out. We're looking at one here that looks, looks very much like a saint, but you can't see it on this particular slide, but above the head is the word Homer. And around Homer's head, there's a nimbus, much like one would find in Christian art. And it looks very much like a Christian saint. And from dating the carbon uh, to carbon 14 dating of the wood and some other evidence we had, we're pretty comfortable saying these panels came from the middle of the fourth century AD, a time when Roman Christianity was really beginning to sweep away paganism. And we are familiar with how uh, Christian art bor borrowed heavily from pagan art. We see here an example of the reverse of one of the seven sages of antiquity being depicted here as a Christian saint. Uh, this was a remarkable find, a unique find. Unfortunately, uh, it came at a bad time. Uh, in 1968, uh, the Greek government was taken over by a regime of colonels, time of the Greek military junta. There were lots of slippage. The panels were not treated as well as they could have after the excavations began in 68. They were transported first to museum at Nafleon, and then eventually wound up at a museum in Ismia, where, where they are today. But for over three decades, really nothing was done with them and the panels deteriorated. Though recently, I'm happy to say, the Greek Archaeological Service has begun restoration work, trying to salvage what was left and who knows what were, what's ahead of us. But this is a unique find of classical art. And it's a, it's a sorry that it wasn't treated better, but that happened. Now I turn my attention now, this is, that was 1964, I'm now going to 1981. I have been working at Caesarea in Israel. I, I show you this picture of a north of the site of Caesarea uh, to give you some idea of, a, of the, the straight coastline that exists in the Eastern Mediterranean. Most places devoid of anything resembling a natural feature that would allow one to have build a harbor. Uh, there are very few exceptions to this. And I also draw your attention to, uh, if you look at the slide carefully, you can see a straight line running parallel to the coast. That's part of an aqueduct system that the uh, Romans built for King Herod when they built his city. It extended from Mount Carmel to the north to the city itself. And as you can also see here, part of the aqueduct has just been carried away by the sea. Coastal erosion has in fact been a factor. Once the breakwaters for the actual harbor were built into the sea, that changed the coastal dynamics. And, and part of the aqueduct was lost. Uh, here's a slide I took of the submerged harbor, harbor ruins. I took the slide in 1986 when our National Geographic was there to do a story on the city. You can see a very large harbor complex to give you some idea of um, the size of this from where the arrow is to the shore is about over about 250 meters. This was a totally artificial harbor built out into the sea. Uh, it is the largest ancient harbor still readily available for archaeological research, uh, meaning that no modern facilities have been built over it. This is where Link started in 1960. Uh, his report was interesting. Uh, he had been drawn to this site because of an ancient text by, written by Josephus. First, in fact, the only real account we have of building a harbor under the sea. And Josephus had said that Herod conquered nature here by lowering large blocks of stone, 60 fathoms. Well, that's a bit of a stretch because the water here is maybe about, maybe 20 feet at the most, but uh, large blocks of stone. And some of these stone blocks have been found by the divers who work for Link. Uh, along with Avner Raban, who was a leading archeologist at the University of Haifa, we put together a team, um, the Caesarea Ancient Harbor Project, and we began systematic work there in 1981 in an effort to um, learn more about how this could possibly have been done. Again, not, nothing in the ancient text telling us how large stones could have been lowered into the sea. What kind of technology was involved in that? 
Now here's where my, I had promised to talk about pixie dust and the Roman Imperial maris, maritime structure. We all know what pixie dust is. Think back to Peter Pan. Peter Pan, that stuff, the, the, the powder the fairies use to make magic happen. I use that phrase because a colleague of mine, Barry Strauss at, at, uh, at Cornell had once said that the pixie dust for the architectural revolution that Rome went through during the reign of Augustus was because of concrete. Not quite true, at least for underwater archeology, span the pixie dust was a volcanic ash that came from the Bay of Naples. I'll have more to say about that a little later. But on one of our early dives, we did find one of these large stone blocks, a massive block weighing probably hundreds of metric tons, 11 by 15 by four meters. At the end of the uh, Northern breakwater, serving as a pierhead, a stabilizing element for the entire break, uh, breakwater itself. When I first came upon this, I said, Bob, your career is made. You have found the first solid evidence of alien intervention. How could the Romans have done this? They did not have the machinery to do it. Happily, I decided not to publish that right away, but to think it through more carefully. And it turns out what we were dealing with was not a stone block, but we were dealing with a concrete block Okay, next question. How could they have possibly cast a concrete block that weighed that many tons, moved it out to sea and lowered it in a precise north, south, east, west axis to serve as a pierhead? The answer came when we discovered these wooden beams at the bottom of this. These are tie beams for wooden formwork. And it became clear that what had happened is the concrete had been poured into the sea in wooden formwork. And nowhere in our ancient texts is there anything like that telling us how the Romans did this. There was some description in, in Vitruvius for a method, but that method was not this. So we had found a new method. And uh, when National Geographic came around and we talked about illustrations over a few beers, we'd, uh, I sketched things out. I thought how it might work. And Bob Turingo, one of their very accomplished artists, came up with this drawing of a hollow, it's turned out to be hollow, a hollow frame being pulled into place. And once the framework was in place, then the concrete mix. Concrete, by the way, is a combination of mortar and aggregate, mortar and aggregate. And aggregate in, uh, in the Latin was caimenta. We'll get back to that in a few minutes, I think. Anyway, this was, this was a, uh, I think, a very effective drawing about how this might have been done. Um, this was exciting to discover that concrete had been used by King Herod, which is really a surprise because concrete belonged to the Romans. They invented it. And Herod, though he was a great builder, he had no builders who had any experience in building maritime structures. How did this come to pass? One of my colleagues project, John Olison from the University of, uh, of uh, Victoria, who was arguably the world's leading authority in ancient technology, though he was just starting his career then. He took a sample of the concrete, took it back to his university, had it analyzed, and it appears that the mortar, the key component of the mortar, was a volcanic ash that came from the Bay of Naples, 2,000 kilometers to the west. How do we know this? Volcanic ash has a distinct chemical composition, and you can, you can tell where the ash came from. Now, how did that get there? Well, that was a question we didn't really have an answer to at the time, but it was intriguing. Later on, by the way, when we decided to look carefully at the harbor of Caesarea, we were able to count every extant concrete block. And from, those, from that number, we were able to determine that to build this harbor, Herod imported 20,000 metric tons of volcanic ash. Staggering number. How did he do this? There's no evidence in our sources about this being a commodity that was traded. No other explanation. Every time we tested or cored one of these concrete blocks, it had volcanic ash in the Bay of Naples. That ultimately led to this book, where a group of us like, formed another team to look at every 
well, about 150 areas in the Mediterranean where we think there's maritime concrete to look at as many as we could to see if this pattern of using volcanic ash in the Bay of Naples is a constant. And it turns out it was. We also have found evidence of Roman concrete, maritime concrete in Portugal, outside of the Mediterranean. How far did it go there? There have also been reports of this volcanic ash in the Bay of Naples being found in archaeological projects in India. How far did it go that way? We're talking possibly about a global trade back 2,000 years ago. And here we are taking a, a core from one of these concrete structures. The idea was to take a core from the interior of the structure not, the, not just something on the outside, but from the interior of it, where presumably we were closer to what the original concrete was like, and then have the concrete course analyzed in a state-of-the-art research facility, which turned out to be in, in Bergamo in Italy. Ital Cimenti at the time was my sponsor. And they, uh, wherever the cores were taken, they were taken to the laboratory, laboratory and analyzed state-of-the-art equipment by the same scientists using the same equipment in the same laboratory. So it wasn't a question of apples and oranges. We had consistent data. And that data has turned out to be very important and sort of helped to create a new interest in what is now called natural concrete. Okay, that was then. Uh, so my pixie dust was the ash from the Bay of Naples. I turned now to, to a project we had in the 1990s, uh, working at another harbor, of a, of a provincial port city at Paphos in the southern part of Cyprus. It was an ancient harbor. You can see the remains of one of the uh, breakwaters here. But the real interesting thing there was, was uh, a find that occurred uh, quite by accident. Uh, a bunch of Australians had set up a dive shop there and we uh, used that dive shop as our base for operations to fill our tanks at night and any equipment that we needed to get. We got to know these guys pretty well. And uh, after a while, we had a couple of parties with them. And at one of the parties, one of the their divers came up to me after having had a few beers and said, what about the cave with the amphora in the ceiling? And I looked at him and said, what? There's a cave where the amphora are on the ceiling? Yeah, it's underwater. How, don't, you don't know about it? And I said, no, I don't know about it. He said, tomorrow we'll go out and take a look at it. Now, I must tell you that in the course of my 50 some odd years doing this sort of thing. I've had a lot of false leads. People, you know, we really like to tell you what you want to hear. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten leads on shipwrecks that have turned out to be dinghies that went down three days ago. I thought, well, this is going to be another one of those, but all right, we'll, I'll go with them. So off we went to a place called the Mulia Rocks, a reef a couple of kilometers to the uh, east of the harbor of, of, uh, of Paphos. Rocks are visible today on a very calm day, but when the sea kicks up a bit, which it does occasionally, these rocks are invisible and they become a maritime hazard. Well, on our dive, we were out there and swimming around and not to my surprise, he couldn't find the cave, okay? And I, we're almost out of air and he finally, he disappears. And all of a sudden I see bubbles coming up through the rocks. And I, oh my goodness, so I went down with him and sure enough, there it was on the ceiling of this cave, a whole bunch of broken amphora, the flying pots of Paphos. I had another great article, the levitating pots. How am I gonna explain this one? And uh, again, here's another one of my members of our, our project and Chris Brandon is taking measurements of it. And as exciting as it might've been, I asked, I, I, of course, I asked my, my, uh, the chap who had found this thing, why do you think it, they there? And so he, they got there and he said, well, my theory is that they were carrying some sort of fruit and it fermented and the gases lifted the pot. So, okay, that sounded good. What really happened? Uh, an ancient ship coming into the harbor of Paphos in a rough sea hit the reef and the rip, the bottom of the hull dripped out and the cargo spread all over the, what was then the top of the reef. Over time, Cyprus, by the way, sits right on the, where the two tectonic plates clash. That's one of the reasons you don't find two-story ruins in the island of Cyprus because of so much uh, earthquake activity. What appears to have happened is at some point in time, the reef itself was breached 
and water, the sea came underneath the reef and eventually carved out a hollow or a cave. And what had been on the surface of the reef became the ceiling of the cave. Another great story that I couldn't publish. Uh, I did publish about the cave of the emperors, but I couldn't talk about the flying pots. Too bad. I'll turn my attention now to uh, the Northern Aegean. I had, in the, the first decade of this century, I had an opportunity to work with the Hellenic Center for Marine Research, uh, their version of, of Scripps or Woods Hole, uh, to do some deep water explorations in the Northern Aegean and off the island of Crete. Uh, in the Northern Aegean, we were looking for shipwrecks that might have gone, to, uh, ships that might have gone on during Persia's invasion of Greece in the fifth century BC. And in our work off Crete, we were looking for Minoan ships or Mycenaean ships, though alas, we did not find any. Uh, but there I had an opportunity to work in uh, Merciple, uh, named the Thetis. Uh, Thetis was uh, the mother of Achilles, some, some of you know, and also a sea goddess. And naming a submersible after sea goddess, not a bad idea. Maybe there's a little connection there. This I found very interesting. I started out in Greece uh, working with diving gear that we had, Joe and I had been able to rent from Greek sponge divers in Piraeus. And they had rented us their diving gear that they thought was unsafe. And we used that, and it was unsafe. Regulators would explode, tanks would fall off our backs. Um, we had no depth gauges, we had no BCs. It was, but then again, in your 20s, as many of you know, you're immortal, you're gonna last forever. So not, not to worry about such things. But that's how I started. And now in the beginning of this century, I'm state-of-the-art underwater technology using uh, a two-person submersible. As you can see, it's a bit crowded in there. Uh, there's a pilot, and in this case, there's me getting ready for one of my dives. Uh, it's pressurized, so we don't have to worry about the bends. That was helpful. Uh, I'm a cautious man. I like, before I take my, my first dive, I ask the pilot, electric batteries, right? He said, yes, sir, electric batteries. You've checked them. Oh, yes, sir, I've got a checklist. Just like a pilot, I have to go through all these things. That sounds good. What happens if the batteries fail? Not to worry. There's a redundant system. It'll kick in automatically. Not a problem. Okay, that sounded good. What about the air supply? Not a problem, a redundant system there. And if that doesn't work, we have these scuba tanks. That sounded pretty good too. So off we went. The way this is, it's the submarine is lifted from the stern of the ship by a big crane, dropped into the water. And here it is sitting, waiting, going a last minute check with the surface. Once you're underwater, we lose contact, radio contact, and you're on your own. But um, last minute check, and then down it goes. Now, it's, for those of you who are scuba divers, this is much like a BC. Uh, let the air tanks down you go. Uh, you can do it with, a, with, the, uh, with, your, with your electric motors, but you're using power. And of course, that's really a key. You want to save all your power you have for when you actually get to the bottom. That also means that as you're diving down, at about 300 to 25 to 350 feet in the med, you lose all light and you are in the eternal darkness of the sea. It is dark. And one of the things that the submarine has to help you stay sane is a tiny little light outside that you can see. And that's kind of, you can't see very much with it, but it's very helpful. It doesn't use much, much power. And then when you get to the bottom, then you crank, turn on the electric motor, motors, turn on your strobe light, your strobe lights, and you have a visibility about 30 feet or so. You have a sonar, and away you go. Well, my first dive in a submarine, down to about 600 feet, hit the bottom, everything's going well. All of a sudden, all the power's off. I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell do I do? I can't open the hatch, and if I could, the water would probably come up with such pressure and cut me in half anyway. And I'm thinking, this is it. It's over. What a way to go. And it seemed like an eternity before the redundant system kicked in and the light started again. 
And I turned to the pilot and said, I think maybe we should head up. And he said, that's a good idea. And we did. And I discovered after I did this, that this was his first flight in this thing. And he had missed something on the checklist and there had been a leakage in and the first system of the electric batteries went out. Okay, two years later, he's experienced, I'm experienced, doesn't have the same concerns anymore. This time I'm operating, uh, we're operating at a depth of a thousand feet in the water and the ocean. Uh, we'd gotten down, it took us a long time to get down. And once we hit the bottom, time to turn on the strobe light and head off for our target. The target had been identified during the night with a side scan uh, a sonar system or radar system. We were able to pick up a possible target. We were there to take a better look at it. Turns out, much to our surprise, we were, there was a pretty strong current, which we hadn't expected, coming at us, a couple knots, and we were going into it. That was a little bit of a surprise. Um, we had our lights on. We could see about 30 feet. And all of a sudden, on our sonar screen, we get a blip coming right at us pretty quickly, and it's a pretty big blip. And I was like, what could this be? Can't see a thing until it gets into our light. And what it turned out to be was a giant squid coming right at us. Boom, hits the bubble full on. And my first impression, my, is the bubble going to make it? Is it going to hold? The squid just made some funny noise and then it was okay. It's, I think it was okay. It swam off and disappeared. And we were just stunned sitting there waiting to see if any cracks appeared in the bubble and we were finished. They didn't, squid left, we were okay. And we decided to carry on. I couldn't help thinking after this was over that that squid had a great story to tell its buddies. There it was minding its own business and it, the mothership tried to capture it for who knows what purpose. Would have been a cup worth a couple of drinks in a squid bar for sure. That was a harrowing moment. That was both those moments were really something that I will never forget. I also at this point might mention that underwater exploration in the deep water is, is in some ways like our efforts in space. We're not really sure whether or not it's going to be worthwhile to send men down in submarines and submersibles like the one I had or bigger ones, or just use underwater robots, remotely operated vehicles or autonomous vehicles. We now have uh, equipment that will go down to the deepest point in the oceans, over 35,000 feet. Oh, and I might just mention in passing, you may not have read about this, but on February 3rd, we lost an F-35 in, this, in, this, in the South China Sea in depths of water about 13 to 15,000 feet. It is our most sophisticated plane. It's got all sorts of things in it that we don't want anybody else to know about. We certainly don't want the Chinese who claim that as their water, though we claim it's international water. We don't want them to find this, sub, this plane before we do and then reverse engineer all that stuff. So using some of our most sophisticated recovery equipment right now, we are looking for that. I hope we hear about it. I hope we get it first. But the potential now is pretty exciting. And I think I can say with some certainty in the lifetime of those of you who are a bit younger than I am in the audience uh, today, that in the next 50 to 75 years, there's going to be some pretty exciting things found in the sea. It's really surprising to realize that for example, there's a 40,000-mile there's a 40, mountain range underneath the water. 40,000 miles extends. We know less about that than we do about the surface of Mars. Those, the, the sea has lots, Poseidon has lots of secrets to share with us, and this equipment is going to help make it happen. Now, as far as my most harrowing moment, I'll keep looking at my watch here because I, I know we have a time restraint. It's not that I want you to go or I think I'm trying to hurry through this. I want to make sure I have time for everything I want to say. Interestingly enough, the most dangerous moment I've ever had in an archaeological project did not happen underwater. It happened on land where that arrow is. It's, as you can see, the southern coast of Turkey. It's uh, an ancient site uh, called Soli Pompeiopolis. 
Hittites first, and then later in the Roman period, a harbor was built there. It's near the modern city of Mersin. You can see here in the distance, the, the skyscrapers, the buildings of the city are encroaching, but have been stopped by the archeological zone itself. Now, uh, this was a, the last field project for building for eternity. In many ways, we saved it to the end because we knew that this harbor, which was built sometime in the middle of the second century AD, sort of represents the pinnacle of Roman harbor construction. It's, it's a combination of the ancient Greek traditions and Roman traditions. And, and it's, we really wanted to end our research there. And also, realistically, it took us a long time to get a permit to work in Turkey. It's not that easy, uh, particularly being an American group these days. It's not very easy at all. Fortunately for us, we did have a, uh, uh, one of my colleagues teaches uh, classics at the uh, chairman of the classics department at Purdue. He's also interested in ancient environmental issues, has spent much of his professional career in Turkey and speaks Turkish. He was able to uh, help us out here. And he made contact with a Hittite archaeologist, Ramzi Yeda, who had the permit to work in the Hittite site at this location. Uh, Ramsey could care less about the Romans, uh, but he thought it might be interesting for, for his project. He might get some mileage out of it if, in fact, he had a team of international scholars come and do some concrete coring in the breakwater itself. It sounded good. So, in planning for this, I gave myself uh, three weeks. I figured I maybe needed maybe a week there to get three or four cores. That should work out pretty well. And then all the problems began. I had to get a work permit in uh, to to do this. Not not a not a, an archaeological or a tourist permit. A work permit. I didn't get that till about. I think I got it at two o'clock in the afternoon, and my flight for Turkey left at five thirty from, from Washington. And the permit I got was incredibly general. It, it, it enabled me to start a rug store or a falafel stand or something else, but I, I needed that. I had that, had that document. We were, had been told uh, in advance, uh, Nick Rao and I had gone the year before to talk to the archeology span uh, headquarters in Ankara about what we wanted to do. And they were very, very interested, very excited about it because nobody in Turkey was interested in ancient Roman concrete at that time. And they said, good idea, but the problem is you can't take your samples out of Turkey. It's against the law. Well, I thought, we have to, because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, everything else has gone to the same laboratory, same scientists, you know, same equipment, as I said before. And one of the heads of the archeological service said, you know, we don't have that same restriction for geological samples. Hmm, okay, that makes some sense, geology. Maybe my concrete cores could be considered geological samples. All right, next problem. How do I get my equipment into Turkey? I, archaeologists have tremendous problems getting equipment into Turkey. It's just difficult to do. Well, here we were helped by the fact that our sponsor, Ital Cimente, had a concrete or a cement company in Turkey that they work with. And the idea was, the way, and again, this we sort of got, I'll put it this way, the, the archeological authorities in Tur Turkey did not say no when we told them what we wanted to do. I took that as a yes. And what we planned to do was to have all of our equipment sent as a commercial exchange from one cement company to the next. All our equipment in there, including some hollow tubes, uh, plastic tubes in this shipping crate. And with, along, with, along with our drilling equipment. Now, drilling equipment is kind of scary when it's all together. It looks like a missile launcher, and we're carrying around metal tubes that are what look like stinger missiles. I can understand the concern here. But anyway, we thought this is the only way we'll get it in. As it turns out, that worked out pretty fine. Uh, Ital Gimente got permission to send this off to their company, going to be from, from Istanbul, then shipped down to Adana, which is where we were. That was going to be okay uh, under the auspices of this satellite company. But when it arrived in Istanbul, uh, customs officials went on strike. I remember I, I'd give myself 13 days here to do this. Strike went on and on and on. 
when it finally ended, I guess we had about maybe seven days left. And then the next problem was the shipping crate did not fit into the planes that fly regularly from Istanbul to, Ad to Adana. So I had to arrange for a truck to truck it all the way down from Istanbul down there. A couple, again, a couple more days disappeared. It gets to Adana, it has to go through another customs inspection. Nightmare after nightmare, when a truck finally, finally we, we were get it and it arrived at our site. And that day, Ramsey says to me, oh, by the way, Bob, we're ending our excavation early because I run out of money. And I said, well, when are you ending? I said, two days. So I, I literally, I had one day, one day to take a core or cores at this site. Things had not gone well. The morning that I had of my day at our early breakfast, we're having coffee around just before the sun's up. Ram says, oh, by the way, you may have another problem. <laughs> what now? He said, uh, as you go into the site, see where the arrow is now, this is important. He said, there's a road there that goes past a, 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 a kind of a motel. Uh, that's where, that's the center of uh, Turkish mafia. They're involved in smuggling goods into and out of Syria. The Syrian border is not very far away. And uh, th they may give you some trouble. They don't like anybody going down on the breakwater. I'm thinking to myself, you tell me that now? I said, that's okay, I'll work it out. So got my truck, head down. There's a lock, there's a gate across this lock where the arrow is, where the across the road where the arrow is. It's locked. It's, the sun is just coming up. I said, the hell with it. So I, we went out, sort of went out in the field and dismantled a bit of the fence and took my truck and drove around, came down to the site. And we started work. Here's my team. There's John Olison to the right. I'm standing there and then Chris Brandon to the left. The three of us are there, plus Nick Rao who's taking the photograph. Our uh, drilling unit is up. We're starting our core. Everything is going well. And all of a sudden, Nick screams down to us. I think you'd better come up here. We've got a problem. And the problem was, by the way, this is I was talking about earlier, a combination of Greek technology for harbors and Roman. You can see the ashlar masonry. Instead of using wood to hold the concrete, make wooden cells, they made them out of ashlar blocks. And uh, the aggregate for the concrete here was beautiful river rock, which is extremely strong. This is a beautiful construction. And it's the best that we have uh, from the Roman world. But again, here's the motel. And as Nick has hollowed down to us, he said, there's trouble. We came up and I looked down the road and coming out and they'd, they'd walk, open the gate and locked it again. Were five of the meanest looking men I'd ever seen in my life, carrying metal pipes doing this, heading right towards us. Where do we go? There's no escape. This is the only way out. I'm thinking, now what? I said, oh my God, squids, one thing. Guys with metal, metal pipes, that's another. They're not too far from us when all of a sudden in the distance, flashing police lights, sirens. And the guys pause, we're all listening to them and they realize that they're coming right towards where we're going. And these guys turn around and quietly go back into the motel and a, a cavalcade of cars, police cars, followed by two limousines, followed by a truck, TV truck show up. It turns out that the mayor of Mersin had heard about our project and decided to come down to get some TV footage for the local news that night of talking to the archeologists about this project and having me thank him for all the help he gave us, even though I never met the man before. He arrives, police there, the police, by the way, the police, a policeman went to the gate, walked into the motel, came out, unlocked it, no problem for a policeman. Then they came up, he spent about a half an hour with us. I knew the rule, I thanked him profusely as the cameras were rolling and thanking him for all of his help and all of that. And he looked around at what we were doing and he handed the, the drill himself, you know, got the images that he wanted about a half an hour. And then he said to me, as again expected, if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. And I said, yes, sir, there is. 
maybe you could put a policeman down there at the end of the breakwater, because I don't want to have people coming up and disturbing us because we only have a limited amount of time. No problem, Bob. And the policeman stayed, and we never saw the men with the lead pipes again. That day, we got back. Next morning, we had to worry about shipping the stuff back. Would it possibly be accepted as geological samples? In Turkey, there's an interesting uh, uh, tradition of protocol to be followed. Every archaeological project has somebody from the Turkish Archaeological Service on the site every day called a commissioner. The commissioner for this project, it was the end of the season. He was happy that he was going home early because you know his light had been interrupted by this. He could care less about what we were doing. And uh, we convinced him that these were geological samples, put them into the hollow orange pipes so that if the custom people looked into the box, they would see the same orange pipes that had come over. They had been hollow when they arrived, but these had some samples in them. We said, let's hope they get back about two weeks later. We got, we got a message from Bergamo that the, the uh, samples had arrived and we made it. So that was, that was something else. Um, now I wanna, and as any underwater archeological lecture, and I guess mine qualifies as that, has to have at least one fish. People expect a fish picture. This is a picture of a humpback this was taken in the Red Sea with my wife, Catherine, who was here tonight. Uh, we were diving there. These are big fish. They can go up to two meters in size and weigh over 300 pounds. And usually you'll get one, one large one sort of stakes out a, an area, and that's his area. And we, had been, we were diving here after this area had been turned back to the Egyptians by the Israelis. And we hadn't realized that the Egyptian authorities allowed divers to feed the fish, which I think is a very bad idea in all, from all directions. I didn't know that, but the fish didn't know that either. The fish thought I had, fish, I had uh, food for him. I thought he was being friendly, just following me around, you know, nice big fish. Uh, they don't, they're not used to attacking people. Uh, I thought it was very nice to have a, a nice big friend. And I was trying to get Catherine's attention, waving to her, and the fish thought I was about to offer it food, and it reached up and grabbed my hand in its mouth. And here's an animal that crushes coral on a routine basis, and it had my hand in its mouth. It felt like someone had slammed a car door in my hand. Get it out. I have my camera around my neck. My other hand, I'm going like this, punching him in the nose. And he's looking at me with his funny eyes, like, what's going on here? And this doesn't, this doesn't taste like an egg. He thought I had a boiled egg. And he eventually let me go and that was the end of that. Now, I'm sorry I didn't get a photograph of it, but I was very lucky. My dive partner that day was an ancient mosaicist, and he got a picture of the whole scene. <laughs> now, as to Forrester, one question that we have, I may have a partial answer to the questions I, I raised at the beginning that got me interested in maritime archaeology. Who were these builders who worked in the sea? Well, there's one inscription that we found for uh, Lu uh, Lucius Julius Valens. He was a caimentarius, which we believe translates as a worker in concrete. He was assigned to the Roman Imperial Navy, the fleet that was at Messinum. And happily, we also got an artist, artist drawing of what he looked like, caimentarius. Here's another caimentarius sitting in a mortar trough uh, after a very, very busy day at uh, a Perlai. Those of you who have come to many archaeological le uh, lectures understand that archaeology is, can be a very hot, tedious, sometimes boring activity. Uh, you can go days without doing anything really exciting, and all of a sudden something happens that is very, very exciting. For me, the working and in, in, uh, building that pier at, um, in Brindisi, was the hardest work that I had done since ranger training in the army. Um, it was tough. It was the hottest September on record. Mixing mortar in a mortar trough, which we have here like the ancients did, was incredibly hard work. And I'm just sitting here relaxing, having a drink of water after a very busy day. And the slide below that, this says it's, I think it's self-explanatory. The end of a very, very bad day would be something like this. 
Have I ever had a shark encounter in the med? Yeah, I have. Mostly on land. Land sharks are worse than ones in the water, but there are water sharks. And I had I had one episode where I was I was uh, in Italy on the Argentario. It's an area north of Rome, where the ancient city of Cosa was. And I had heard from someone up there about a, a an Etruscan shrine in a cave that could only been reached now by swimming through a tunnel into this cave. And I thought, well, I should take a look at this. So there I was starting into this tunnel and there in the tunnel was a sleeping nurse shark. Now, there are many nurse sharks in the Mediterranean and they're pretty docile animals most of the time, unless you are in their way of getting to the open sea, which I was. I looked at the shark and said to myself, what are you doing here? The shark looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And the shark decided to head to the open water. He had two ways of doing it, through me or under me. You know which way he took, because I'm here. <laughs> anyway, and I'm going to end this now before I pick some questions uh, with a typical maritime salutation. Uh, fair winds and following seas for all of you. And for those of you who are here in the audience, please be careful going home, because it's going to be pretty treacherous out there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for what a, what a wonderful lecture that was. Um, so much to talk about. Um, should we, Sarah, do you want to do, um, should we take questions in person first and then see if there's more on the Zooms? Well, I thought we might um, want to give an opportunity to perhaps some of those in the audience who may need to leave for some reason to uh, leave before the question uh, portion actually starts. Um, but we do have um, numerous questions that we can start with online so we can um, just go with those first and then if you okay. need to go, um, please go ahead and, and feel free to do so. Thank you again to Dr. Holfeld for a wonderful talk. Great. Okay. So um, Payson Sheets has a question. Huh. Payson. Payson wants to know, have you done archaeology under fresh water? And if so, how does it differ? <laughs> Payson, no, I haven't. I haven't done any water, uh, freshwater uh, archaeological work. I, I've been very spoiled. I like working in the warm waters of the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. And to the best of my knowledge, while I haven't done it, there are some sites that I would like to look out, look at and on rivers in the Mediter in the uh, European area where Roman um, concrete was used for bridges, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. And I'm leaving that for some other graduate students to do in the future. Um, there's another question about where the ash, the volcanic ash from oh. uh, Naples was quarried. Was it quarried from the slopes of Vesuvius or the harbor of Naples, somewhere else? Very good question. Uh, the ancient texts talk about something called Pulvis Puteolanus, which means the dust from the area of Puteoli, which is a northern part of the, mountain, of, uh, of the uh, Bay of Naples. And it, it would not have come from Vesuvius itself, but there are two other volcanoes in that area uh, that were less that are less well known. And we've also discovered in our investigations that this ash from this whole region, even though there are slight variations in it, uh, appears in our various concrete blocks that we've cored from around the Mediterranean. So even though the one source that we have, the written source, uh, Vitruvius talks specifically about volcanic ash from the Bay of, from Puteoli. Actually, any of the volcanic ash from the Bay of Naples area works, and the Romans used it all. Interesting enough, they did not, they may have tried using it from other volcanoes in the Mediterranean, like for Santorini, for example, uh, which would have been closer to some of their harbor sites, but they didn't. Now, the Roman builders were, were masters. They, they, were in, in, they had empirical expertise. If something worked, they did it again. If it didn't work, they gave it up. And we don't know how many experiments with different types of ash that they had that, they, that didn't work. We know the ones that did, and that's from the Bay of Naples. Um, there's a question about why you couldn't publish about the pots in the cave. Oh. But you did, right? They just not, you didn't publish them as 
I did. I, I, I pub published it as the Cave of the Amphoras, and I explained uh, that this was a, a reef with several shipwrecks, and I did mention in there that there, there had been a local tradition that these pots had levitated, but I did not publish them as the flying pots of Paphos, no. Right. Um, one question, I, I volunteered years ago to dig near the Sea of Galilee. You couldn't walk 10 feet without finding some broken shards of pottery. Why did ancient people keep dropping their pottery? <laughs> <Good question>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think they dropped their pottery as much as they, these were habitation sites along the Sea of Galilee or the Canaret. And uh, over time, with rains and so on, so soils get washed away and br broken pottery. It's the type of question that someone in the future might ask about, why do they keep leaving their plastic bottles everywhere? Uh, the same sort of thing. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they left them there intentionally. But also, you have to realize that every habitation site had some sort of, a, of an area where they dumped with their trash, too. So that was a possibility. Did you ever think about working somewhere else outside of the Mediterranean? No, because I like warm water. I, I did. I did a little. I did some work with the national for uh, World Heritage in uh, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, but not archaeological work. There, there, there was certainly enough for me to do in uh, in my field of interest in the Mediterranean. And as I said, I'm I'm still working. I'm working on a project now that I hope I have time to finish. And if I finish that one, I've got another big one in mind. So plenty to do in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, there's a question about these um, robotic or you know, unmanned vessels yes. to do underwater archaeology. Um, and the question is, do you think they would be more or less valuable than being there in person? Um, or about the same? Um, I think, I think uh, over time, that's going to be the way to go because when you send human beings down there, you have all kinds of issues about how long they can stay. Air supplies, it's much more complicated than just sending down a robot that will stay as long as the batteries last. And as, the, as our robotics become more and more sophisticated, and as we know, first of all, it's happening in our space program, but eventually it's going to happen in our, on our oceanographic research as well, uh, we'll be able to do more things more quickly and less expensive by sending machines down than people. I say that you know reluctantly because I certainly have enjoyed going down in submarines and looking at things, but I think um, it's more efficient perhaps to send down a robot. A thousand feet's a lot. <laughs> really well, I've been down deeper than that. That's uh, I got down once to about fifteen hundred feet, and I at that point our little submarine was starting to make some funny little noises. And I asked the pilot, what's the maximum depth here for this machine? He said, well, we're a little bit over it. <laughs> I said, oh, really? He said, I said, what do you think the tolerance is? Well, maybe 10%. I said, well, let's figure 5%. How much further can we go? He said, well, actually, we should be heading up now. So we did. Um, this, is, this is a good question. Um, how was the volcanic ash? How did that actually aid in the production of concrete, or how did it, okay. what, what qualities did it have? Sure, that's a good question. The ash itself contains uh, calcium, aluminum, silicates, and hydrates. Think the word cash. And when this is combined with slaked lime and seawater, again, we didn't know how the Romans, if they used freshwater or seawater, but considering where some of these harbors were built, and when they were built, there was no adequate source of freshwater. It had to be seawater, so we use seawater in our in our peel, peel up. But once seawater turned out to be the key, when all these three things are combined, it makes some mortar that pr produces a, yet another element, aluminum tobermerite, and that seems to be the critical ingredient. And what happens in more uh, use again, add aggregate, you know, concrete, concrete over time, the chemical reactions of of the ash and the lime and the seawater. Incre decrease the porosity, the pores of the outside surface of a concrete block, eventually rendering it waterproof. It becomes like rock. Now, cement use reinforcing rods, which we use now in harbor construction, 50 years on the outside. Maybe more, more, more there'll be some sort of disintegration and the concrete will begin to crumble. The Roman monuments are 2,000 years old and they're still there. 
Now think, think of my little pila in the, in the Bay of Brindisi. I periodically, by the way, check in on Google Earth to see how it's doing. And it's now being used as a little uh, mooring area for rowboats. That's got possibly a 2,000 year, or at least 1,000 years ahead of it. Um, so Roman concrete, maritime concrete, is an interesting new material. Material scientists are looking at it very carefully. We can't, there isn't enough volcanic ash in the Bay of Naples to, to use it to make my Roman concrete all over the world. But is it possible that we might be able to come up with some sort of an artificial substitute? Our main, uh, my colleague Marie Jackson, who's a, a scientist at the University of Utah, has just been invited by the US Army Corps of Engineers to submit a proposal to a program called um, Engineering with Nature to see if it's possible to manufacture this tephra, this volcan tephra is volcanic uh, rocks that are sp split out, spit out by a volcanic eruption. But is it possible using crushed glass to recreate the conditions that might enable a concrete, much like Roman concrete, to be created given its longevity and its durability? So it's interesting. As I used to tell my students, the ancients keep stealing all of our good ideas, and this might be one of them. That's fascinating. There's a couple more here, but I don't know if I want to. Yeah, we're. Anyone in the audience want to ask any questions? Yeah, sure. Just back to the concrete. Um, is there evidence that it was used like on land structures, or was it primarily for harbors or? Well, that's a good question. Uh, did the 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 Romans developed a very, very strong concrete that could be used in terrestrial uh, structures by itself. But if there was any chance of groundwater or any chance of uh, in an area that might have been inundated, let's say right at the shoreline, then this Roman maritime concrete would have been used. Yeah. So, um, but was it used, let's say, uh, in, the, in the middle of, uh, of Switzerland, I don't. I don't think so. We haven't found any evidence of it. Okay. There's one here too. There's a couple over here. Sure. Hi. Uh, you talked a little bit about the 1960s and 1980s, but what did you spend the 1970s doing? I'm sorry. Uh, you talked a bit about the 1960s and the 1980s, but what did you spend your time in the 1970s? Oh, 1970s. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when I got out of the uh, the army and sort of my academic career, as I think all young academics know, you're pretty darn busy trying to publish your way into tenure. And I was pretty darn busy working on material from Cancri. I wrote, I had two books published on ancient numismatics and I was working on that. And then again, as I, say, as I said to you earlier, uh, timing is everything. I happened to get a, a fellowship to work at Dumbarton Oaks, which is Harvard's uh, Byzantine Research Center in Washington. And I was there just at the right moment when the director of a land project at Caesarea had come to Dumbarton Oaks to see if there was anybody there that the director could recommend who could study the Byzantine coins that had been found on this land excavation at Caesarea. I was there at the right time. And I said, yes, and that got me to Caesarea and then and the underwater stuff started again. So. I've been I've been very lucky along the way. Um, maybe just one last one. Yeah, yeah. I was curious why would Herod go to the trouble to bring twenty thousand tons? He probably had mountains nearby. He, he did, but, but again, his engineers. For, oh, that's a very good question, which I answered in another book that I have here called King Herod's Dream. Uh, but uh, he had many reasons for building that particular city which he called Caesarea, and also the harbor, which was called Sebastos, which is the Greek equivalent of Augustus. It was in a statement, he, he was announcing to, uh, after the civil war between Mark Antony and Octavian, Octavian won and became Augustus. Unfortunately, Herod had been in the area that was controlled by Antony. He had to figure out some way of showing his loyalty to the new regime. So he decided to build a, this is a strange thing, a Jewish king and a Jewish kingdom building a Greco-Roman city. But he did that as a statement of homage to the new regime. He, he was associated closely with 
Augustus is second in command at the time, Marcus Agrippa. They had been friends and he actually had helped Marcus Agrippa and military operations in the Black Sea with his own fleet. And Agrippa had been the master builder for Augustus. Agrippa had been the one who built the first harbor complex or in the, in the Bay of Naples, a place called Portus Julius. And with a connection between Herod and, and Agrippa, Agrippa got the technical assistance that he needed to build in the sea because he had nobody who could do that. And the, the coastline, as you saw, was completely straight. He had to build an artificial harbor out into the sea. No one had done that before. So it was a technology, it's a Western technology being translated to the East. And because of the connection with Agrippa and Augustus, he was able to have Roman grain ships, these big freighters that were sailing from the Bay of Naples, which uh, that was the large harbor for Rome until they built one at the mouth of the Tiber. They would sail to Egypt in ballast, pick up grain and bring it back to Rome. The ballast during the time of the building was this volcanic sand. And that's how he did it. And without his connections, it, it couldn't have happened. He also was a very wealthy man. And as we know, that, that goes a long way then and perhaps even now, getting your way. So anyway, this, this is Greco-Roman city with, with, a, with a Roman temple to, dedicated to Augustus itself, overlooking the harbor was built by a Jewish king. And he also was announcing to the world that even though he was a Jewish king, he was really his subjects, no matter what their religion, were welcome. Wonderful. Good thank question. You so everybody for being here. Let's thank our speaker once again. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. That looks fantastic. Sure. Thanks so much to our online community, and I hope that you'll join us again for our next lecture, which is going to be on March 16th by Dr. Payson Sheets, um, talking about his work on the Maya. Thanks so much.